People often question, why is this city located here? Civilizations follow the great river systems. Waterborne transportation drove city locations. Basically every great port in the world are at the mouth of a river system that allows them to send goods inland. New Orleans was in one of the most strategically important trading spots, not only in the country, but in the world. They were looking for that connection, and that's why ultimately there were canals that were built that connected the lake to the river. New Orleans was put here because it's the connecting point between the old world and the new world. New Orleans is where it is because of the Mississippi River. The river carrying the sediment in a fairly fast-moving current hit the ocean. The mud would settle out onto the bottom, and that was the land building process. The river carries enormous amount of sediment. So much sediment that the Mississippi actually created all the land from Cape Girardeau, Missouri, to the Gulf of Mexico. The ocean used to go up to Cape Girardeau, Missouri. But sea level fell, and the sediment, the mud that the river carried, filled in all this enormous land. 35,000 square miles is roughly equivalent to five of the six New England states. New Orleans is sitting on ground that the Mississippi River built. And if it weren't for the Mississippi River constantly depositing silt in this area, there would be no ground for New Orleans to be built on when you consider at one time this area was underwater. It was under the Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf Coast extended along the north shore of what's now Lake Pontchartrain. There were barrier islands where New Orleans is today, and that was all built up and eaten away. The river builds and then eats away. When you think about the Mississippi River, most people think about this essentially straight line going from above Minneapolis all the way down past New Orleans to the Gulf. But the reality is the river system, you could say it begins almost in Buffalo, New York, in the east, on the west, all the way from the Rockies in. That's all the Mississippi River system. The mouth of the Mississippi has moved in a relatively short period of time, like seconds in geological time, from the state of Mississippi almost to Texas. If we had no levees and flood protection structures and what's called the Old River Control Structure above Baton Rouge, the mouth of the Mississippi would very likely have moved by now, probably after a great flood either in 1927 or in 1973. It probably would have moved down the Atchafalaya River and the Atchafalaya would now be the mainstream of the Mississippi River. Lake Pontchartrain only came into existence a few thousand years ago, and a very few thousand years ago. So New Orleans is built on now. Orleans, Jefferson, St. Bernard, Plaquemines Parish, all, all the main part of the, uh, the most heavily built up part of the urban area and where the city was essentially just concentrated was underwater just a few thousand years ago. And if the river changes course and goes to the East Jaffalai, there's every good chance that unless this ground is maintained, it could eventually break apart without the silt being added to it, and we've certainly seen that in Plaquemines Parish where, you know, large sections of the parish have just disappeared except for the levee and a few buildings along that levee and all that outer wetlands area has just disintegrated into the Gulf. Everything from about Jack's Brewery up to about Jackson Avenue, Riverside of Chapatulis was added to the city in the late 1700s, early 1800s. As the river slowly shifted its channel, it naturally deposited alluvium there and it created a batcher. And the city eagerly incorporated it into its mist by building a levee. We're looking right out here in Carrollton. There was a crevasse flood in 1816 that flooded out the area and caused a lot of distress. It filled in the back swamp, it flooded the rear of the city. But do you know what it also did? It deposited a rich layer of sediment. If you look at a topographic map to this day, you see that Carrollton Avenue is on something of a higher ridge. So just within that one event, the topography went up and humans benefited from it. La Salle came down the river and claimed Louisiana for France, went back home and then came back again and tried to find the river from its mouth and missed it and wound up in Texas and got himself murdered by his unhappy crew members 
The French had laid claim to the Mississippi Valley. They realized that the Mississippi River at least potentially represented an all-water route from their colonial outposts in Canada through the North American continent to the Gulf of Mexico. Locating a deep water port and village on really the first high ground north of the Gulf of Mexico made a lot of sense. The French saw New Orleans not only as a community to protect the southern end of the empire, but it was also a trading center that could be served by Lake Pontchartrain and also by the Mississippi River. And as early as the 1600s, Marquette and Joliet were suggesting that a great L-shaped trading route be formed connecting the tip of the Mississippi River, up the Mississippi River, the Illinois River, a portage where Chicago is today, perhaps construct a canal connecting that in Lake Michigan. And then you have the Great Lakes and finally the St. Lawrence. Quebec and Montreal were established trading centers there. So here the French would have this great L shape up the Mississippi River through the Great Lakes and along St. Lawrence. And this is what many of the trade boomers of the day were envisioning, you know, French control of a very large section of North America. Between the earlier French colonial settlements at Biloxi and Mobile, across the Mississippi Sound, through the Wrigley's, through the protected waters of Lake Pontchartrain, up Bayou St. John, there's a two-mile walk along a ridge, and then you're right at the river. It was only a short portage, a mile or two, between the Mississippi River and Bayou St. John. The whole notion of a portage is this short route in which you carry your craft from one water body to the next. That explains why the Enville selected the French Quarter for New Orleans. The Native Americans were actually the ones who were leading the French explorers to where this great river was located. The river kept getting lost on European maps. You find maps as late as 1705 showing the Mississippi River draining practically down to the Rio Grande and the Ohio River flowing somewhere near Montgomery, Alabama. It really wasn't until the DeLeo map of 1718 that the river was truly pinpointed to its correct mouth, and it was the Native Americans who were really helpful in leading the explorers back to this great water. When Iberville first came up the river in March of 1699, he saw a number of different Indian tribes. He saw bison almost precisely in what is now downtown New Orleans. The area that roughly occupies some portions of the French Quarter today was, if not a permanent settlement, at least a seasonal trading area for native peoples in the area. A few years ago, during some archaeological work on a property owned by the Historic New Orleans Collection, the first professionally documented evidence of Native American presence in what is now the French Quarter was unearthed. Before the French market was established, it's where the main trading part of New Orleans was located, and it was pretty much a free-for-all, but it was right on the riverfront. If Bienville located New Orleans at other sites that were in the running to become New Orleans, such as Bayou Manchac and Natchez. He would have founded the city on better sites. They're higher in elevation, they're safer from floods, but they would have been greatly removed from the lower Mississippi and they would have been very far from the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. If you look at the location of Chicago, Chicago, like New Orleans, was on a portage route between a great body of water, Lake Michigan, and the Des Plaines and the Illinois River. There was one way to connect that. There was this little Chicago portage that explains the location of Chicago. New Orleans, dependent as humans were in that era on waterborne transportation, needed that little portage between those connecting water bodies. The river and the lake, the two go hand in hand. Because when New Orleans was founded, it was founded because of the location on the river, but also because of the ability to move goods and shipping through Lake Bourne, Lake Pontchartrain, and Bayou St. John. The lake was the front door as opposed to the back door. It was an official port of entry. There are many travelers arriving at the lake and then taking trains, what ultimately became known as the Smoky Mary. You were at the foot of what becomes Elysian Fields and taking this trek, this almost five mile trek to the city itself, which is the Via Carre as we know it today. In its early days, most of New Orleans trade was coming in via Lake Pontchartrain. Some was coming in from France, some was going to French colonies, some was coming from the Gulf Coast to serve the town, but you know, there wasn't a lot of trade here. As the United States began expanding west of the Appalachians, 
they were using the Ohio River and the Mississippi River and sending their goods down to New Orleans. It was the only real way they could get their goods out to the sea, even to the east coast of their own country. By the time you get into the late 18th century and the early 19th century, it was perhaps the most important port in the United States. This was before the Erie Canal. This was before the Miami Canal connected the Ohio River and, and Lake Erie. This is the country was growing westward. It was going to need an outlet to the world. And New Orleans was it. Bring your goods down to New Orleans, sell them, spend a while here having a good time, then get back home before winter sets in. Before steamboats, you would get these keel boats that would come down the river. But the effort to take the same boat up the river against the current was almost impossible. Barges, keel boats, they would come down here and they would sell the whole boat, goods and all. And the boats would be torn apart and used for construction. New Orleans was a growing city and there was a lot of wood to be used. When they dismantled these keel boats, they had these long pieces of lumber and that sort of determined how they were building the houses. Prior to the late 1870s, the river was silting up. Ships were forced to wait until high water came down at the mouth of the river, and ships were beginning to bypass New Orleans and take cargoes elsewhere. In the late 1870s, the Eads jetties opened up the mouths of the river, and river traffic boomed after that point, not only in New Orleans, but upriver in Memphis and St. Louis. The year before the jetties were open, St. Louis, shipped less than 5,000 tons of goods down the Mississippi River. In 1879, the year the jetties were finished, it shipped over 450,000 tons. The city exists to send commerce through the mouth of the Mississippi River out into the Gulf and into the world. Port cities, New Orleans being no exception, have the opportunity to define itself through the cargoes that come into it. It still holds true that if you have something big, heavy, bulky, and voluminous, the best way to get it from one place to another is to float it there. In the old days, those things might have been furniture or manufactured goods, and to the degree that those things, which we now think of as antiques, remained in New Orleans by virtue of having arrived here on a ship, I think that has helped to define another uh, cultural element of the city and its uniqueness. By nature of these different water bodies and the convenient transportation access that they provided, you're going to have different peoples here, and you're going to have these rather complex societies that form here because of that crossroads nature. We know how this being a port city, how it's affected the culture. The importance of that, of course, for music in terms of the exporting and importing of sounds, like, for instance, Jelly Roll Morton, you know, talked about the Spanish tinge in jazz. Well, where did that come from? It came from the Caribbean countries and the mix of the Spanish. In New Orleans, a number of the people arriving here were immigrants, whether they were European immigrants or whether they were Africans here under duress. New Orleans was not only a crossroads, but a sort of a settling out point for a lot of these populations. Something about it makes them want to stay. And so being a port has very much shaped the cultural character of the city. Businesses here, shippers here have always wanted to have some sort of connection between the Mississippi and the lake and a shortcut between New Orleans and the Gulf of Mexico. It was a long-held dream. It went back to the 1820s, this dream of building a shortcut. New Orleans is surrounded by shortcuts. From the Old Basin Canal, the Carondelet Canal, and then later the New Basin Canal. These were water routes that stopped short of connecting with the Mississippi River, but did permit goods being carried by boat to come to the downtown area of the city where offloading them would have been a relatively easy matter. The inevitable question is, was there a canal on Canal Street? There was a grand plan to have a canal connecting the lake to the river. The canal would run from the river and turn at what is known as Basin Street and over to the auditorium today. They were going to connect the old Basin Canal, but that never happened. Once the industrial canal was built in the early 1920s, the old Basin Canals no longer served as much of a purpose because the industrial canal enabled shipping to pass between the river and Lake Pontchartrain uninterrupted. 
in the interest of navigation, we've perforated and scored and scoured the deltaic landscape with the Industrial Canal around 1920, the Intracoastal Waterway in the 30s and 40s, and then most infamously the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet Canal in the 50s and 60s. These, to greater and lesser extents, have been a benefit for navigation, but they've seriously wounded the city in creating these pathways for surge to enter the heart of the metropolis. The geography that the river and Lake Pontchartrain produce when they come together near New Orleans has had an effect on how the city itself has grown or been unable to grow. New Orleans has been called the Ile d'Orléans, the Isle of Orleans. You have Lake Pontchartrain to the north, Bayou Manchac connecting that with uh, the Mississippi River and the Mississippi River. So it was literally an island, but also it's figuratively an island, because if you go up to around 1800, this was an island of pretty substantial wealthy civilization and a pretty barren part of the world. So we were an island in more than one way. You did get a sort of compressing effect of neighborhoods. The high ground along the river was relatively narrow, and so the shape of that land and its relatively small percentage of buildable area has accounted for the way that New Orleans developed as a fairly tightly packed urban area. Most ports are far more cosmopolitan than areas that are fairly close to it and have far more influences from different cultures than most areas. And then of course you had our history of public markets. You'd have the Native Americans coming to the markets with their herbs and their sassafras, you know, for gumbo filet and that sort of thing. You would have Africans who would sell at the market and provide goods at the market. The nature of the city being a port city, not only exporting goods from the American interior, but being a point of arrival for goods from around the world, did give the population here access to things that inland cities would not have had at all. And so the ability of the population here to sort of take advantage of the first use of products, whether they were manufactured goods or foodstuffs or anything else, people here had the opportunity to incorporate that into a lifestyle and the use of spice is certainly one of those. A tremendous amount of trade came in through New Orleans and a tremendous number of people came in through New Orleans and they brought their cultures with them and shared them and merged with what was already here. While much more immigration came through New York, for many years in the late antebellum, New Orleans was number two. Higher numbers of immigrants came at least through New Orleans, if not settled in New Orleans, than Baltimore, Boston, and a number of other cities combined. Not only the space foundation from colonial period of Spanish and French and African and Canary Islanders, and then later people with a more New World experience filtered to the Caribbean through Saint-Domingue and Cuba arriving in the early 19th century. Then Irish laborers being brought in in the 19th century, German immigrants, and later in the 19th century, Italian immigrants, and then later still, Yugoslavs, Croatians, people who are now identified in a lot of the seafood trades in New Orleans, and even today, the Vietnamese and Hispanic populations. This might have been America's first genuinely multicultural metropolis. New Orleans was there before the rest of the nation was there. If you want to understand New Orleans, you have to come to terms with paradox and dilemma. New Orleans lives by the river, and it can also, you know, it can die by the river. New Orleans was founded in 1718, and by the spring of 1719, it was experiencing its first river flood, and Bienville was complaining that people were splashing through ankle-deep water for a good portion of the spring. We erected artificial levees to confine the river. That eventually succeeded in ending that age-old dilemma of river flooding. But in doing so, it constrained the river. It severed that annual replenishing of fresh water and sediment to the back swamp and the wetlands. And in time, those areas started to degrade. Every time it flooded in nature, it would drop somewhere between two and six inches of mud on the land that it covered. This turned what used to be a dynamic delta A plain that seasonally flooded and deposited the sediment. It turned it into a pipeline. 
that in which most of the sediment ended up here on the continental shelf. On top of that, you have navigation canals, which perforate the area, allow saltwater intrusion, occasion coastal erosion. You have oil and gas canals. Whenever you see these hard 90 degree angles, it's probably oil and gas canals. There's also some discussion that the actual literal removal of the petroleum from the geological layers uh, occasions a certain level of subsidence. Louisiana has lost 2,100 square miles of land, and that's essentially the state of Delaware. If you put the state of Delaware between New Orleans and the ocean, then New Orleans doesn't need any levees. So that's how much land used to be there that has melted away. Paradoxically, in solving the river flooding problem, we transferred the flood threat from the river to the Gulf of Mexico. Hurricanes for the city were not necessarily considered a major concern other than wind. And when the Custom House was built, it was one of the great trading centers of the world. They didn't anticipate that the city would be going underwater. The city was still, for the most part, above sea level. We sort of have a double whammy coming at us. We have the Gulf coming more and more inland, but then we've also had upwards to 80 years now of expanding more and more into low-lying areas of the city. And of course, as we go into those low-lying areas, like a sponge, they subside a little bit more. So we're getting it coming from both directions. New Orleans is a city that's sort of between a rock and a hard place because we have to maintain this water for our prosperity, for our existence. At the same time, the river and all this water surrounding us can inundate us. Trying to argue about moving a city might make interesting parlor conversation, but it's not something that's likely to happen. The nature of New Orleans, the port, the community that it serves upriver in terms of uh, being an entrepot for cargo inbound and outbound is too difficult to ignore and it's inconceivable to think of moving such a thing. Trade, if anything, is more important today than it used to be. I mean, we are now a world market for everything. The city exports 60% of the grains that the U.S. exports. There are several different port jurisdictions that divide up the tonnage. If you combine those various jurisdictions, it is by far the largest port in the world. It is the busiest port in the world. The fact is, if you did not have a port roughly where New Orleans is, then the entire economy of much of the central part of the country would be severely damaged. Well, you just don't up stakes and move a city. Most of New Orleans isn't necessarily below sea level. A lot of it is above sea level. And the idea of just up and moving a city, it's beyond my notion and it is frustrating, especially when you consider that there are people in states like California who live in highly earthquake prone areas, areas highly prone to fires, highly prone to landslides. Why do they have the option of being able to go back? New Orleans is part and parcel of the larger American story, and the nation would be incomplete without it. It would be a lesser nation without it. Coupled with the fact that I think that this problem can be solved by tapping into the resources of that river, the fresh water, the sediment, and the bottom of the river can be used to solve this problem. I think it'd be a great test case for us to hone our skills as a nation to saving coastal and riverine metropolises. The reality is sea level is going to rise, and on the one hand, New Orleans is potentially in a better situation than most cities in the world that are exposed to sea level rise, and that's because the marsh is alive and the marsh can adjust to a rising sea level. Those plants, and the, if you give them sediment to build upon and things like that, they will rise with sea level. The river, just by nature of what it is as a natural feature, certainly has the capacity to create new land if allowed to do so. And because we have become so accommodated to living on its banks, we have to understand that 
coziness that we have with the river by our ability to control it is something that has allowed many wonderful things to happen. It doesn't take off the table the fact that some catastrophe might occur. It is going to be the savior of this area because, yes, it is going to rebuild the wetlands. Again, it's going to be controlling the river, human beings trying to take a force of nature and rebuild something that has already been taken away. And as part of the natural course of things, we're just trying to juggle the situation so that it preserves the land on which a million people live. Water is becoming this increasingly rare resource. I mean, not only oil, but water is this precious commodity, which perhaps, once again, we tend to take for granted. Boone Pickens has called water the oil of the 21st century. In the next decades, that's going to be increasingly important. We have a surplus of 500,000 cubic feet per second of relatively high quality fresh water passing by us every second. You look at places like Atlanta, the Florida Peninsula, the entire Southwest, what's the number one municipal problem? It's water supply. There are five million people up in greater Atlanta. They didn't plan for this to happen. Well, then maybe they should close Atlanta down and move all those people somewhere else, because what are they gonna do when they don't have water? Phoenix, Tucson, Los Angeles, San Diego. Now, at least we won't run out of water. And making New Orleans a center for the study of water, fresh water in particular, I think is a real opportunity. Virtually all of the great cities in the world were built somewhere along water, and many of them are built very close to the coastlines. If the seas rise at the rate that some are predicting, you're going to see very large sections of London go underwater, large sections of New York, even hilly San Francisco. In some cases, almost entire countries would go. So if we're able to devise a way to protect New Orleans, which is one of the lower of the cities, it's certainly something that can be used in the next half century to a century or whenever the time arises to protect these other great centers as well. And I frankly feel that New Orleans is protectable. As we address the vulnerabilities of New Orleans, as we put existing technologies together or develop entirely new ones, because there are a lot of very creative people who are looking at this stuff, that is creating an opportunity for an entire industry, both a scientific center and even to a certain extent conceivably an industrial center, but a leading point in the world for dealing with rising sea level. This is a natural place for that. What greater magnitude can you envision than the literal disappearance of an entire metropolitan and cultural region? When you contemplate the loss of the place that has given you one of the world's most identifiable cuisines and forms of musical expression, then you kind of wonder if this place is destroyed or abandoned or otherwise let go to ruin, then what future things will we be missing out on? That's sort of what you're abandoning if you decide that New Orleans needs to be reclaimed by the sea. Well, wait for a bright new morning. We can loaf along. 